have come to the realization that I can't be an atheist on YouTube if I don't have a Pascal's Wager video. So here it is. Today, I'm going to explore the very different versions of the argument. The colloquial one of, what if you're wrong, and the one Pascal actually posed to atheists. Pascal's Wager is really the risk between punishment and reward. If you're an atheist and you're right, you lose nothing and gain nothing. If you're an atheist and you're wrong, you lose everything. If you're a Christian and you're wrong, you lose nothing and you gain nothing. If you're a Christian and you're right, you gain everything. So why not take the safe bet? When going up against the colloquial form of Pascal's wager and the question, what if you're wrong, it's important to ask them the same question. What if they're wrong about which God is real, or if any God is real? What if you're wrong on whether or not belief is the criteria upon which your afterlife is based? What if there is a God that values intellectual honesty? What if there is a God that puts us in a world that has many claims about many gods and rewards those that reject all of them on the grounds of the lack of evidence supporting a particular one? What if the Muslims are right? Or the Hindus, Jains, Buddhists, or the Zoroastrians? What if none of them are right? Do you really think it's wise to make a decision like that based on insufficient evidence and base life and afterlife decisions on that? This demonstrates that this form is a false dichotomy. It makes the assumption that there are only two options. It ignores other heavens and it ignores other hells. It ignores all afterlives that we've come up with and all afterlives that we cannot even comprehend. The problem with false dichotomies is that they pose a dilemma that is unanswerable. The question is flawed and malformed, so it's impossible to give a sufficient answer. It's also important to realize that this form isn't an argument for the existence of God. Rather, it's an argument for the belief in the existence of God. Let's entertain this point for a bit. Let's say that I determine the risk and reward of the reality of this claim and come to the conclusion that it is truly the safe bet. If there exists a God that rewards belief over deeds, and I'm just believing because I'm afraid of the consequences, wouldn't an almighty God see right through my facade and send me to hell anyways? Furthermore, this argument drills down to the primary fear that religions exploit, because they invented it. A fear of eternal damnation and suffering. Am I afraid of hell? Absolutely not. Why should I be? I have no reason to think it exists. It's akin to saying, you don't believe in Santa? Aren't you worried he'll give you coal in your stocking? I'm not worried about getting coal in my stocking, for the same reason I'm not afraid of hell. Moreover, the model proposed by Christianity is an immoral one that builds up their god as a mafia boss that says, that's a nice soul you have there. It would be a shame if something happened to it. But more on that later. Let's jump back to assess the risk of the wager. Should we bet on getting into the best possible heaven, or should we bet to avoid the worst possible hell? But even in Christianity, there isn't a consensus on the eternal reward or the eternal punishment or by which one attains it. Is there a literal hell? Are we merely annihilated? Is that a bad thing? Is it better than servility? Do we need works, deeds, or both? Is it by grace? Or is it an arbitrary, predetermined result? Or maybe it's none of those. Another problem with the argument in its colloquial form is that it assumes belief is a choice. Is that even possible? Even Pascal realized that people cannot simply choose to believe something. As Robert Oxton Bolt put it, a belief is not merely an idea that the mind possesses. It is an idea that possesses the mind. The claim is that we lose nothing if we believe in God, but is that really true? I argue that we lose a lot if we have a belief in a false claim. Beliefs don't exist in a vacuum. Our beliefs affect our actions and our actions affect all the other people around us. Time and money are spent in prayer and worship and are wasted if you believe in God and happen to be wrong. 
The world lost out on possible mathematic breakthroughs because Pascal was more interested in theology than math. Your ability to reason is constructed by the things you believe or don't believe. Every false belief you hold will increase the likelihood that you will accept other false beliefs. Depending on which God you believe in, you might not accept the age of the universe. You might be in opposition to equal rights and find yourself voting against your own best interests because your particular religion tells you it's wrong. You might give up your humanity and integrity to devote your life on the altar of an idea that seemed like it might be a safe bet. So now let's take a look at Pascal's original version and see what Pascal thought and how it's different from the modern colloquial version of the wager. He begins his argument stating that if there is a god, he is infinitely incomprehensible, since having no parts or limits, he has no affinity to us. We are then incapable of knowing what he is or if he is. That's a curious claim to make. If you don't know what he is, or if he is, how can you determine that he is infinitely incomprehensible? This is just a response to the classical definition of God that defined God in this limitless way. Pascal realized that, and noticed that we can't prove his existence or reason ourselves towards belief in him. He goes on to say that it is impossible to prove God's existence, so we shouldn't criticize people who can't prove it because they're the ones being honest. Thus, if you accept Pascal's wager and still offer evidence for God, you're dishonest. Pascal has a straw man doubter that says it is silly to bet on heads and it is equally silly to bet on tails. The true choice is not to wager at all. Pascal argues that you must wager, and in this he's actually correct. There is no choice when it comes to belief. There is no middle ground when it comes to believing and not believing. But Pascal is only concerned with accepting the Christian God, and not only the Christian God, but this narrow version of the Christian God that he accepted. He is only contrasting belief in the God versus disbelief in that God. Pascal goes on to say, we want to be right, but we can't know, so we must bet. It's almost as nice as wanting to believe as many true things and as few false things as possible. But as far as I can tell, Pascal isn't worried about the truth because he's convinced he already has it and is just trying to convince others of it. He then wagers that if you gain, you gain all, and if you lose, you lose nothing. Wager then, without hesitation, that he is. But is that really true? I've already addressed some of this, but to move on, the straw man objects by saying he is wagering too much. Basically, that he is being asked to wager his integrity, his life, his humanity, his honesty. Pascal thinks that finite certainty is trumped by infinite uncertainty. This is where I think Pascal makes a crucial mistake, saying and so our proposition is of infinite force where there is finite stake in a game where there are equal risks of gain and of loss and to the infinite to gain. How on earth did Pascal determine that there is equal risk? Essentially, this brilliant mathematician is failing to demonstrate the risk or probability of his claims. Pascal is asserting that there is equal probability between the proposition that God exists and the proposition that God doesn't exist. You can calculate the odds of winning the lottery because you know the variables. This is not true for the existence of God, and Pascal knows this, as he just finished defining God as incomprehensible, which makes the calculation impossible. Pascal later goes on to acknowledge that some people may never be convinced, and responds to this by suggesting to pretend and act like you believe to one day deceive yourself into believing. This is one of the most offensive assaults on intellectual integrity that has ever been offered. Pascal already makes flaws in the argument, but his response to skepticism is to go ahead and pretend. He's no longer arguing for belief in God, but for belief in belief. The reason we see so much of Pascal's wager is because it exploits people's fears of hell and the afterlife. It feels right 
and powerful and promotes intellectual laziness. It requires people to not think outside the box and requires people to not have a good understanding of philosophy, theology, or science. It's not a safe bet. It's the perfect con.